Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second virtual event for the Bound with History series, the history of illustrations and early printmaking in Europe. So um, I would like to say, uh, before we get started, my name is Chela Vaidinathan. I'm the librarian for European history, world history and philosophy at Emory University Libraries. And my colleague, Elizabeth Shoemaker, the rare book librarian at Rose Library and I are hosting this event together. So we have two excellent speakers with us today and Beth uh, Shoemaker will be going ahead and introducing the speakers shortly. Before that, I would like to mention that we have closed captioning available for the event and we will also be recording the event as well. Um, so if you could, um, we have a Q&A after the speakers are done with their talk. So if you could please hold on to your questions until then, that would be great. So without much further ado, Beth. Hello, everybody, and welcome for coming to come that for coming. There we go. Um, so I'd like to introduce our two wonderful speakers for this evening. Um, first, the first speaker will be Dr. Kylie Fisher. She is a specialist in early modern European print history, and she completed her PhD um, in art history at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Kylie's teaching and research interests are fueled by a desire to disrupt the traditional narratives and silos that are present in the art historical canon, advocating for the decolonization of art history in both academic and museum settings. She is committed to making the study of art, culture, and history accessible and relevant to all students and aims to instill a sense of empathy and activism in her students to combat the prejudices that are often promoted through works of art and architecture. Dr. Robert Gaines is a distinguished physician and professor at Emory um, and uh, at Emory University School of Medicine, and he's also an attending physician at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. In addition to over 135 medical articles and book chapters, he's also the author of Germ Theory, Medical Pioneers in Infectious Diseases. Dr. Gaines teaches a course on the history of medicine to graduate medical students at Emory and introduces students to the work of Andre Vesalius through encountering the Emory Health Sciences copy of De Humani Chorus Fabrica that was published in 1543. Welcome to Dr. Fisher and Dr. Gaines. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us this evening. So we'll start with Dr. Fisher. All right. Can somebody just give me a thumbs up or let me know if they can see my screen? Fantastic. Um, well, first I want to thank Beth Shoemaker and the rest of Emory University's Rose Library for inviting me to speak um, with the, uh, participate in the Bound with History lecture series this evening. I'm very excited to be with all of you. Bombarded with headlines about the pandemic, the latest stock market numbers and photographs that showcase our friends' culinary talents or recent family vacation, the average American receives approximately 65 to 80 notifications per day through their smartphone. We are so accustomed to having access to information with the simple swipe of a finger that we often take for granted just how revolutionary the reproducible and portable medium of print would have been for mass communication prior to our modern digital age. Before the invention of the internet, how did news about current events, scientific discoveries, and emerging cultural trends reach public audiences both near and far? Until the advent of photography at the mid 19th century, virtually every printed image depended on a woodblock or copper plate that was carved or incised and printed by manual or mechanical pressure. Arguably one of the most influential inventions of the pre-modern world, the printing press offered novel opportunities for the mass production and distribution of information presented in both visual and textual form. While most people today only see early modern prints on display in museum galleries or in the reading room of a library, from the 15th through the 18th century, viewers would have encountered these objects throughout their daily lives. Prints decorated the interior of the home and broadsheets or cheaply produced single sheet prints on a topical and often controversial subject were displayed outdoors in communal gathering spaces like fairs and tacked up onto the walls of taverns. 
The European printmaking revolution began in the 1440s in the Rhineland of Western Germany, where the goldsmith and publisher Johannes Gutenberg created his mechanical printing press. Gutenberg's press, when coupled with inked movable type, allowed paper to be efficiently imprinted with letters. It was this invention that enabled him to realize his eponym, the Gutenberg Bible, a Latin Vulgate edition of the Christian scripture. As prolific as Gutenberg's printing press was, it was designed to privilege text, and human expression takes verbal and visual form. It should be of little surprise then that around the same time Gutenberg developed his system for letterpress printing, the first independent printed images on paper were produced. It is, important, it is important to recognize, however, that the technique for replicating two-dimensional pictorial designs was not an invention of 15th century Europe, but has its roots in the ancient Asian world. Yet, we cannot overestimate the profound effect that reproducible and portable printed compositions had on the exchange and development of artistic styles, subjects, and technologies in the early modern period. Before the development of prints in the Western world, artwork like altarpieces, portraits, illuminated manuscripts, and other luxury items were primarily found in the residences of affluent patrons or ecclesiastical spaces like churches, quite simply because it was the upper classes and religious leaders in the community who possessed the financial resources to fund artistic projects. In comparison to more expensive materials like paint, wood, marble, and bronze, paper was relatively economical. The increasing availability of paper and the reproducible format of print afforded the growing middle class in early modern Europe the opportunity to collect art for their homes. Yet, not all prints were destined for display in the domestic spaces of middle class families. Powerful and wealthy figures, such as Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, commissioned propagandistic printed compositions like his monumental Triumphal Arch, which is comprised of over 36 large sheets of paper and printed from nearly 200 individual woodblocks, and was intended to be installed on the walls of government buildings and palaces of noblemen. The vast majority of prints in the early modern period, however, were bought on speculation, meaning they were not made at the request of a specific client but produced for and distributed on the open market. Prints sold at fairs, markets, and in local publishing shops depicted a range of subjects meant to appeal to a diverse collecting public. As private devotional practices became increasingly widespread among Christians from the 14th century onward, we see prints of Christ, saints, and biblical episodes produced in great numbers. Additionally, the desire to study the historical past, literature, and even natural science encouraged printmakers to supply the art market with images related to ancient history, mythology, and human anatomy. Print production cultivated what we can consider the first instances of the democratization of art in mass communication. The practice of producing printed images on paper in Europe started in the late 14th century, first in Germany and subsequently spreading to the Netherlands in areas of Northern Italy, and it involved the use of woodblocks. A type of relief process, a woodcut is made with a gouge or knife used to carve away the areas of a composition that an artist does not want printed. The result is a woodblock design comprised of raised lines. An artist then inks the matrix or the carved woodblock. With the addition of manual or mechanical pressure, the block is impressed onto a sheet of paper, creating a mirror image of the carved composition. The advent of the woodcut technique radically changed how imagery could be disseminated now that it took reproducible form. A single woodblock had the potential to yield around a thousand quality impressions, engendering an effective way of distributing visual information across a wide viewership. The relative affordability of print, combined with the growing practice of private worship in the home during the 15th century, led to the proliferation of woodcuts featuring Christian subjects. 
which were produced as inexpensive devotional aids. These kinds of prints were often folded up and carried in pilgrims' pockets during their travels. Many were also pasted onto the inside of book covers or displayed on the walls or furnishings of a home. Petrus Christus's portrait of a female donor kneeling represents a woman praying at her pre dieu hands clasped in veneration, and her book of hours open as her devotional guide. In the background, tacked onto the wall with red sealing wax, is a woodcut of St. Elizabeth of Hungary. Presumably the namesake of the woman in the painting, this print would have served as daily encouragement for her pious practice. Although highly prized today by museums and art collectors for their rarity, the earliest woodcuts were not intended to be permanent or stored away for safekeeping. From the key examples of 15th century woodcuts that do survive, we can learn valuable information about their visual character. The so-called Madonna of the Fire, named for allegedly surviving a fire that destroyed the building in which it was housed, represents a rare early woodcut of the Virgin and Child with surrounding vignettes of saints and biblical scenes. The figures and framing architectural elements are rendered with typical bold outlines. When carving a woodblock, an artist must be careful not to produce raised lines that are too thin, or else they run the risk of cracking when pressure is added to realize the printed impression. For this reason, we see virtually no shading created through linear hatching, and the patterning on the Virgin's mantle is limited to a simplified floral motif. This results in a kind of stencil to design to which a collector would often apply paint by hand to enhance the emotional appeal of the image. This was certainly the case for this German print of the Pieta with the wooden crucifix on which hang implements of the passion, including the crown of thorns and whip. The print's owner added streaks of red paint along Christ's body to suggest the blood dripping from the wounds he received at the crucifixion. This addition of color was meant to inspire the beholder to meditate on Christ's suffering, thereby encouraging an empathetic response. Remnants of adhesive are found on the reverse of this image, along with tiny holes made by insects, indica indicating that the Pieta was pasted inside the cover of a book, which ultimately led to its survival over centuries. Within decades of its invention, we see the woodcut technique develop in complex ways. By the late 15th century, the German artist Albrecht Dürer found a way to portray impressive textural qualities and tonal subtleties through this medium. His Four Horsemen from the Apocalypse reveals the exquisite line work for which he is celebrated. Through juxtaposing areas of white paper with curving lines of varying thicknesses, Dura evoked the soft, flexible nature of the horse's mane. Published shortly before the year 1500, when Christians feared the world would end, Durer's print represents a passage from the book of Revelation that describes the fury unleashed at Christ's second coming. Four horsemen embodying death, famine, war, and conquest have arrived to signal the end of time, indiscriminately trampling all men and women in their path. This print conveys the chaos and despair that the apocalypse was believed to bring through the galloping horsemen in billowing clouds that move swiftly against an ominous sky comprised of finely hatched lines. At the bottom center of the composition, Durer proudly featured his monogram. When this print circulated on the open market, there would have been no question about who produced this remarkable image. Although Dura was an accomplished artist well acquainted with the world of print, scholars continue to debate whether he carved his own woodblocks or if he was solely responsible for their designs. From the onset, woodcut production involved a division of labor that incorporated the talents and efforts of multiple professionals. It was customary for an artist to design the composition directly on the matrix and leave the arduous task of cutting the block to a professional carver trained in the arts of carpentry. In some workshops, there, have, there may have been a designated figure tasked with inking and printing the blocks to make the individual impressions. An entirely different person may have also fulfilled the role of publisher, 
by overseeing the selling and distribution of prints. Depending on the size and the equipment available at a given workshop, some artists contracted out the task of printing and publishing their images. If a printer did not own a press, they had to collaborate with another local shop to issue their prints. The legacy of this collaborative practice is still seen today. Many contemporary printmakers team up with a printing shop to create their work and partner with the commercial gallery to exhibit and sell their art. In the late 1480s, Durer worked as an apprentice under Michael Volgamut, who is best known for illustrating the 1493 printed encyclopedia, the Nuremberg Chronicle. The medium of woodcut became intimately connected with book production because it was quickly adopted as the most efficient way to illustrate a printed text, since the carved wood box could be placed within the same framework as the movable metal type and run through the press together. While at Volgamut's workshop, the young Durer participated in the collaborative process of making illustrated books. Given the number of different agents involved in the printmaking enterprise, as an independent artist, Durer could have easily shared the labor of producing his woodcuts with other specialists, freeing up his time to focus on more lucrative commissions. As we have seen with Durer's Four Horsemen, more complex prints provided enough tonal variation that they did not require the addition of hand coloring. Yet, in other cases, it seems that collectors still preferred the aesthetic and emotional intrigue of colored prints. In the 16th century, printmakers capitalized on this interest by producing chiaroscuro woodcuts. Chiaroscuro, an Italian term that means light dark, refers to a type of drawing that features an image on a colored ground. The colored paper serves as a middle tone to which an artist adds white pigment to produce light tones and renders the darker areas of the composition like shadows with hatch marks or an ink wash. The same concept applies to a chiaro scooter woodcut. Take, for example, Lucas Chronic St. Christopher. One wood block, called the tone block, creates the orange midtone. The second block, or line block, is used to render the primary linear design in black ink. Any areas left unprinted represent the highlights in the image, like what is seen with passages of the sky and the light hitting the saint's cloak. This technique produced a tonal image that appealed to print collectors' affinity for color. Shortly after the first woodcuts were produced in Northern Europe, intaglio printmaking emerged in Germany during the 1430s. And by the second half of the 15th century, Italian printmakers had adopted this method for creating prints. The word intaglio derives from the Italian verb intagliare, which means to cut. Engraving, the oldest type of intaglio print, involves incising a design into a copper plate that has been hammered thin enough to be able to cut into its surface with a lozenge-shaped tool, called a burin, leaving behind V-shaped grooves. In contrast to the relief process, any part of the copper plate that is cut away forms the resulting printed impression. Once a design has been fully incised, the matrix is inked. Next, the plate is wiped clean so that only the ink deposited into the recesses will remain. Now the matrix in a damp sheet of paper are run through the press. As the paper is pushed into the recesses of the incised lines, it picks up the ink, resulting in a mirror impression of the composition engraved on the plate. Decorating a metal surface with a series of linear marks using a stylus or burin was a common practice among gold and silversmiths. In fact, the process of engraving is closely related to that of baking yellow plaques. Small plates of gold or silver featuring an engraved design inlaid with a powder or paste that when fired cools to a rich black, creating a legible image. Due to the association with metalwork and the more costly materials involved in making an intaglio print, namely the copper plate, engravings were usually produced in smaller editions than woodcuts and therefore typically fetched a higher sales price. While early engravers helped supply a market eager for devotional prints, 
They were also interested in ornamental content, as evinced by Martin Schongauer's image of a metal sensor. Such a subject is rarely seen in contemporaneous woodcuts. Print scholars suggest that the refined imagery and engravings appealed to a wealthier clientele. And thus, these works were collected as fine art pieces much earlier in their history than woodcuts. Engraving enabled skilled artists to create richly detailed and stylistically varied compositions because they did not have to worry about their incised lines breaking under the pressure of a mechanical press, like with a woodcut. Netherlandish artist Lucas von Leiden's The Milkmaid demonstrates the versatile line work that is possible in engraving. Thin cross hatching is employed to render soft shadows along the body of the cow standing in the foreground. The line's varied lengths, depths, and directions create a voluminous form that emphasizes the animal's anatomy. Lucas was also able to imitate different textures through his varying engraved marks, including the bark of the trees and the rope wrapped around the horns of the second cow while still maintaining the simple outline of the mountains in the background. Made for an open market, the milkmaid is representative of the new kind of secular subject matter that appeared in print. Perhaps meant to appeal directly to the increasingly diverse public who could afford to purchase prints, scenes of everyday life quickly developed into their own pictorial category and found a ready market among middle-class collectors. From the beginning, the reproducibility and portability of print was recognized as a principal advantage of the new medium. Artists who were not trained to make prints themselves collaborated with engravers to disseminate their designs to a wide public. Starting around 1510, the Italian Renaissance master Raphael partnered with Marc Antonio Raimondi to produce engravings after his designs, such as the Massacre of the Innocents. This subject derives from the book of Matthew and recounts the story of when Herod the Great, having heard of the birth of a savior, ordered the execution of all male children under the age of two in Bethlehem. This engraving showcases Raphael's ability to devise a complex composition of moving and emotive figures who are organized harmoniously within a naturalistic setting. During the early 1510s, while Raphael was painting the private library of Pope Julius II in the Vatican, Michelangelo was working in the nearby Sistine Chapel. Raphael's choice to depart from his characteristically graceful scenes of standing saints to a narrative of twisting powerful bodies may have been a deliberate strategy to promote himself as Michelangelo's rival. Through the consistent swelling and tapering of his parallel and cross-hatch lines that follow the curves of the figure's bulging muscles, Marcantonio successfully rendered voluminous bodies in contorted positions that are appropriate for such a violent episode. We can certainly understand why Raphael wanted his name displayed on the podium toward the left edge, crediting him as the inventor of the composition. Below Raphael's name is Marc Antonio's monogram, another prominent declaration of authorship that promotes his efforts as the engraver. Like Durer, Marc Antonio and Raphael recognize the potential of print to cultivate a far-reaching reputation. Another intaglio process that developed in Germany during the early 16th century was etching. Whereas engraving originated in the workshop of gold and silversmiths, Etching was closely connected to the armorer's trade in Augsburg, a city in southern Germany. The development of etching is attributed to Daniel Hopfer, who used the technique to render ornamental designs in the surface of metal armor. Unlike woodcut and engraving, which are purely manual processes, etching involves a chemical reaction to create a plate capable of producing a printed image. To etch an iron or copper plate, an acid resistance varnish or wax called a ground is applied to the matrix surface. With a stylus or needle, an artist draws a design into the ground, removing some of that material each time a mark is made. After the design is completed, the plate is submerged into an acid bath and a chemical reaction occurs. 
the acid bites into the areas of exposed metal where the ground has been removed, resulting in a series of linear grooves. Once the plate is taken out of the acid bath and the remaining ground is removed, the etch matrix is ready to be inked and run through the press in the same way as an engraving. While an engraver must exert a considerable amount of physical effort to incise a copper plate, in the etching process, the acid does that laborious work. Therefore, etching was considered an easier alternative to making an intaglio print. Artists who were adept at drawing, but not necessarily trained to engrave copper plates, found etching to be a suitable medium to make prints. Realizing an image in the waxy ground with an etching needle was akin to drawing with a pen on paper. Italian painters who were skilled draftsmen, such as Parmigianino, took to etching naturally. Parmigianino's The Entombment reveals the kind of expressive line work that an artist can achieve through etching. In contrast to the highly regularized marks seen in engraving, Parmigianino's print is characterized by a looser sketch-like design that imitates the fluid lines of a pen drawing. A third type of intaglio technique, dry point, represents the simplest printmaking method, and it emerged in the late 15th century. A dry point is made by scratching into the surface of a copper plate with a stylus or needle, throwing up a burr, or a raised edge of copper. Instead of removing the burr from the plate surface, like what one would do when making an engraving, it is left along the edges of an incised line. Akin to how a furrow or trench dug into the ground holds drifts of snow, the raised edges of a dry point mark retain ink, producing velvety lines when printed. The precise feature that gives a dry point its special character is also its vice, so to speak. Unlike an engraving or etching, which can yield hundreds of impressions of the same relative quality, the delicate dry point burr wears quickly each time a plate is run through the press. Consequently, dry point was often used in combination with other intaglio methods to add finishing touches to a composition. Yet, some printmakers, such as the 17th century Dutch master, Rembrandt von Rijn, preferred to work entirely in dry point. Rembrandt's Ecce Homo, or Christ Presented to the People, shows the kind of velvety richness that is possible through dry point. For example, the contours of Pontius Pilate, Christ, and the surrounding soldiers reveal the dense, blurred character of the dry point burr. Since dry point marks cannot withstand the effects of creating numerous quality impressions, Printmakers like Rembrandt often rework their plates to render more legible images once the bird deteriorated. Each time a single plate is reworked, a new state of the print is produced. When comparing different states of Rembrandt's composition side by side, the changes become immediately apparent. The once strong velvety lines that characterize the first state of the print have largely disappeared in the fourth. Moreover, modifications to the iconography of the scene are visible. Most noticeably, Rembrandt added a balustrade at the upper right in the fourth state. By creating new versions of an image, Rembrandt continually supplied the open market with different compositions without having to create an entirely new design. This was a shrewd business maneuver that kept up demand for his work in an increasingly competitive market. Indeed, Rembrandt capitalized on the marketing potential that the printed image afforded to a greater extent than perhaps any other early modern artist. Even though Rembrandt produced numerous self-portraits in diverse media throughout his career, it was through the circulation of his self-portraits in print that his image was most widely disseminated. Whereas many of Rembrandt's early etched self-portraits capture his whimsical personality as a young man, like this image of the artist at the age of 24. His later prints on this theme show a more contemplative side. Combining the techniques of engraving, etching, and dry point, this print portrays the artist at work near a window, caught in a moment of tranquil reflection. He interrupts his work to address the viewer with a direct gaze. 
This print gives us insight into how Rembrandt would have worked. The plate he is etching rests on a folded piece of cloth that is propped up on several books to allow him to etch his image at a slight angle. Through such a printed self-portrait, Rembrandt crafted and promoted his persona as an intellectual and introspective artist capable of producing moving images. Printmaking introduced new possibilities for visual communication in the early modern period. Scholars have long recognized how the public circulation of pamphlets criticizing the Roman church's sale of indulgences and the Pope's supremacy, along with printed portraits of Martin Luther, such as Lucas Chronic's engraving of Luther as an Augustinian monk, galvanized Protestant reformers in Northern Europe, spurring on a religious revolution. Outside of Europe, prints proved to be especially potent tools for disseminating new beliefs to foreign lands. European missionaries who traveled to the Americas starting in the 16th century brought with them prints of biblical figures that were instrumental in converting indigenous populations to Christianity. From the 15th century onward, prints permeated societies across the globe, spreading ideas and images from one place and generation to the next. What we consider to be mass media today truly has its roots in the early modern world of printmaking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kylie. We'll give um, Dr. Yanes a minute to get sort of set up and then we'll continue with this presentation. Okay, I believe I've got my uh, first slide shown, everyone's nodding, so I will proceed. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, uh, Beth and, and others for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to speak particularly um, directed towards one work, a, a book that was published in 1543 called De Humani Corporis Fabrica, which loosely translated means on the workings of the human body. It was published, as I mentioned, in the year uh, 1543, also the year that Copernicus published his Orbium Celestium. So it was really quite a year. This book had an enormous effect on, uh, on medicine in particular, but it was also a bit of a masterpiece when it comes to bookmaking and uh, uh, to some extent, art in general. And in order to understand that, I wanna take you back a bit and give you some context as to why De Humani Corporis Fabrica was such a major book uh, in the history of medicine. And, and to do that, we need to go back to the influence of a man named Galen. He was a physician that worked in Rome in the second century of the Common Era. He believed in the so-called Hippocratic theory of disease, the idea that everyone was composed of four fluids or humors, and the role of the doctor was to get the humors back in balance if they were out of balance. And that could be done by a number of, of approaches, but it was the first theory of disease that didn't involve the supernatural. And some 500 years before Galen, it had been promulgated by Hippocrates and his colleagues. But human dissection in the time of ancient Greece was forbidden. And the ancient Greeks knew virtually nothing about the anatomy of the inside of the human body, which was something that Galen had added both by uh, studying for a very short period of time. He wasn't around when they were doing human dissection in the medical school of Alexandria, but he studied there. And he also did animal dissection. He introduced, for example, that healing could be a science. He discovered that urine was actually made in the kidneys, not in the bladder as previously believed, by showing in animals that if you cut off a tube from the 
kidneys to the bladder called the ureter, uh, you would stop urine production. So he showed that healing could be a science, but he, because he inferred animal anatomy as human anatomy, he made some egregious errors. But unfortunately, because of his personality, he was a very egotistical, perhaps the most egotistical physician that's ever lived. Um, he literally wrote that no further research was needed. If you wanted to understand medicine, all you needed to do was to read my writing, said Galen. And unfortunately, he was believed because he left a body of work that was deemed so conclusive that it literally inhibited any progress for a period of about 1,500 years. And that the works of Galen essentially had a stranglehold on the practice of medicine. In fact, during the Middle Ages, if you were to even criticize Galen, you could be accused of heresy and excommunicated. So you can imagine this had a bit of a chilling effect on any advancement in research. Well, into this era comes the man, Andrus Vesalius. So let me tell you a little bit about him and his life. He was born in Brussels in what is now Belgium in 1514. And he grew up on a hill. He went down the hill and up the next hill. You reached what was called Gallows Hill. This was an area where uh, individuals were executed and very often their bodies, and as time went on their bones, were just left. And he, as a child of eight or nine, showed an unusual interest in anatomy. He would go to Gallows Hill and try and put bones together, and he started dissecting uh, everything from insects to small mammals. And he became almost obsessed with this. He became very good at it as well. Well, he decided, due to the fact that he came from a long line of physicians, to study medicine. He started out at age 15 at the University of Louvain, but in 1543, he moved to Paris, and he learned anatomy the way everyone at that time was learning anatomy in medicine, which was the professor you can see here sitting up on high and reading, droning on from Galen. And there would be an untrained barber surgeon down doing the dissection and simply pointing out whatever it is the professor said he were to show from Galen's work. So it was really not to describe accurate anatomy, but just to show everybody how accurate, how right Galen was. Um, and these events, because they were events when there were dissections, there were very limited dissections during uh, the period uh, as Vesalius was entering the medical world. And the reason for that is that about a century before, the church began to relax its restriction on human dissection. And it did so not so much for the benefit of the doctors, though they did benefit some, uh, but largely for the benefit of the artists who wanted to understand human anatomy. And it was then left up to the local bishop as to whether or not a certain dissection was going to be allowed. And the person doing the dissection was the one, if you will, at risk. So the professor sitting up on high, if it were, the bishop deemed this was not an appropriate individual to have dissected, would not have been the one at risk. It would have been this lowly barber surgeon. Well, a war between France and the Holy Roman Empire interrupted Andres Vesalius' study, and he ran from, from uh, Paris to Padua, uh, a town about 20 minutes outside of the city of Venice, to complete his medical training in 1537. He completed it, and because of his ability in dissection, literally one day after he graduated, he was made professor of anatomy. And Vesalius decided he did not like the way he had been taught anatomy. And he became the very first professor to perform his own dissections. Well, he formed very early on a crucial alliance with an artist also Flemish named Stephen Jan van Kelchar, who is a protege of the artist Titian from Venice. 
And together, they worked on a series of very accurate uh, figures that they published in a bit of a transitional work called Tabuli Anatomici Sex. I remind you, sex is the uh, Latin word for six. And there were six tables, so some of you may be disappointed. Um, there were six different figures that were uh, used in order to teach students anatomy. And here you can see uh, Sir William Osler about a hundred years ago. Uh, there are very few of these uh, 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 tabulae anatomicis uh, uh, left. And this is one in the Bodleian Library in uh, Oxford University where Osler was working at the time. But it got Van Kelchar and, and uh, Vesalius working together. And they learned who were the, the top uh, woodcutters in Venice and to some extent who were uh, good at, at the publishing end of it. Well, Vesalius became a very popular professor. Um, this, by the way, is a woodblock. And you'll notice, this is from the Museum of Printing in Lyon. You'll notice um, at a very close period of time, uh, the detail or perhaps lack of detail in, in the woodblock. But as I mentioned, Vesalius became a very popular professor and he was invited to the University of Bologna. Uh, the students there invited him to do a dissection while their professor, a man named Corti, read from Galen. And I, I think the students knew what was gonna happen because Vesalius had been doing these dissections. He knew Galen backwards and forwards and he would do dissections and he began to have this disquieting feeling that there were many times when the works of Galen were wrong. And he couldn't quite figure out exactly why there were these differences. Well, when he was in, in Bologna in 1541, he was listening to Corti reading from a passage in, in uh, Galen about a bony structure in the back, which he suddenly recognized from his animal dissection as being a bony structure only in animals and it hit him. He realized why he was seeing all of these differences between what he was finding doing the dissection and what was written in Galen. It was the fact that Galen had never actually dissected a human. He never says this in his work, but it was true that, that human dissection was forbidden in Rome. And it was clear to, to Vesalius that Galen had never actually done a human dissection. That's why there were all these differences. So he decided at that point that he needed to write a book. And he went back to Padua. And as I mentioned in 1543, just about a year and a half later, published this sensational book, the book that really changed medicine, De Humani Capors Fabrica. Now, why was this so important? First, it was the first truly accurate book on human anatomy from somebody who did their own dissections. So it was that, and he corrected, as you'll see, many of the errors that Galen had made in his work. Second, there was a real change in the style of pedagogy. The book was essentially a dissection guide, and it was a a change in the style of teaching away from believing everything that Galen said, that belief in only the authority of Galen. And Vesalius would write in a way where he could say to the reader, if you don't believe me, if you do the dissection this way, this is what you'll find. So you believe in what you can observe. And it was a bit of a dissection guide, which was true. And it was also one of the very first medical texts to use figures at all. But the figures it used were truly remarkable. The figures included 12 full page figures, such as the one I'm showing here, and another uh, probably two to 300 other figures that were partial page. And as I mentioned, Galen um, uh, Vesalius had corrected over 200 anatomical errors from Galen's work. You can also see the way he showed in his figures going from the previous slide and first on your left and then on your right, 
the the figures are showing the dissection of the musculature of an individual so that you could learn what was uh, the the most superficial to what was much deeper in a really remarkable way in addition you can see the these were all from woodblocks the remarkable detail that was obtained uh in in uh, carving out these uh figures from the from from the work of von Kelchar. Now, the other thing that's of interest, you'll notice that each of the figures that I just showed had a background to it. And when you lay these full page figures together, the background matches up. And scholars have, have shown that the background was actually Padua in uh, the middle part of the 1500s. But you can see that they do tend to match up, which strongly says that these were done on a scroll uh, and uh, once the figures were done, the scroll was then cut up for the, uh, the making of the wood blocks. Uh, it wasn't just muscle men that were, that were drawn, of course, but here you can see on your, on your left um, a, a figure of the various blood vessels of the body, and on your right, figures relating to various nerves coming out of the brain. So again, I remind you how much detail can be obtained by looking at these figures. Um, again, here is a skeleton. This is this, a skeleton that it's likely Vesalius grave robbed. Um, and he always had this available to him when he was doing a dissection so that he could uh, essentially use the skeleton as a roadmap while he was doing dissection. And this is a figure of it. And you can see some uh, on your right, some of the smaller figures that were contained within uh, this. And if those of you, because it's I know difficult to see on these uh, Zoom calls. Uh, if you're interested in seeing these in uh, much higher resolution, the National Library of Medicine at the NIH has digitized uh, all the figures from Dehumani Corporis Fabrica, which is where I got some of the figures you've just seen. This is the frontispiece of uh, the Dehumani Corporis Fabrica. And here you can see, um, uh, the artist is making several comments here. First, you can see that in the middle of the screen, uh, this is uh, uh, an image of Vesalius himself. And we know this is uh, uh, a good likeness of him because we have other portraits of him. You can also see down here at the bottom below the uh, figure of the uh, uh, cadaver being dissected that uh, there's a portrayal of these um, uh, these. Uh, uh, barber surgeons are no longer needed to do the dissection, that it's Vesalius doing it. Up here is a picture probably of the um, artist von Kelchar himself, and next to him is a figure representing the church saying that this is, excuse me, uh, that this is okay, that this dissection is, is, is fine, and that there should be no uh, repercussions from doing this dissection. They were typically um, executed criminals that were dissected. And finally, I'll show you uh, down here in the uh, lower right corner, you can see a the uh, figure of a goat. And this, what I think, was the artist's sort of dig at Galen. Because if you look at the front, you can see the, the goat's normal front paws, but the back foot is actually a picture of a human foot. And I believe this is, was a bit of a dig that Galen had inferred human anatomy from animal anatomy. Um, he dedicated this book, by the way, to Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, it's likely, we don't know exactly, but it's likely von Helchar did a coloring of the frontispiece for that particular edition. Uh, to my knowledge, that was the only one that was uh, painted. Now, you'd think that a book that had this kind of detail, the first accurate book on human anatomy, uh, the idea that it was really a, a major change in the approach, the dissection guide, the pedagogy, you think that this would be very well received. Turns out, Vesalius was viciously attacked because he refuted Galen. And in fact, his anatomy professor from the University of Paris probably gave him his worst attack when he wrote a letter to the Holy Roman Emperor saying, I implore his imperial majesty to punish severely as he deserves this monster 
born and bred in his own house, this worst example of ignorance and gratitude, arrogance and impiety to suppress him so that he may not poison the rest of Europe with pestilential breath. That's how viciously he was attacked. Well, Vesalius was so angered by these that he, he left his position in Padua, burned all his papers. And to some extent, the last laugh was a, a, a bit on Silvius because Vesalius's father had been a physician in the court of uh, Charles V. And Vesalius actually became a physician to Charles V, though he was never entirely comfortable with that position. And he died in a shipwreck at age 50. But he left with us an enormously significant book. It was a return to observation and science, not blind faith in the authority of Galen. That is, believe only that which you can observe. And this book reset the entire center of gravity in medicine. It showed that Galen could be wrong in ways that were irrefutable. It also inspired physicians and scientists for centuries. So it had a broader significance than simply an accurate book on human anatomy. Many historians believe that this book is in fact the most important book in the history of medicine. And as you've heard from Beth Schumacher, the Rose Library at Emory University has one of the surviving copies of this book. And it's always a, a delight to be able to show this to, to our students and show how really important books can still be. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaines and Dr. Fisher for those wonderful talks. Um, we'd like to take questions actually from the audience. You can put those in the question and answer um, box or um, we're also monitoring the chat. So, um, might need to mull over a little bit, but I imagine that there will be some, some thoughts and some questions. So far we have a thank you message about the, uh, to the speakers and the program mm -hmm. was wonderful. So I have a question. <laughs> Let's, we can start with me. Um, um, Dr. Fisher, I was so interested to hear that um, that people were creating um, essentially engravings uh, on metal so early. But it's interesting because you don't see them in books until much later. I wonder, I know that you're not a book historian, you're a print, print historian, but I wonder um, if you have any thoughts about um, why they didn't make, into, make it into books until much later. So I briefly touched upon this in my talk, but the framework of where you can, um, you know, situate essentially incorporate movable type um, also allows uh, for you to put carved wood blocks in there. So that same framework was used. And that's why we see in the beginning that book production really revolved around woodcuts rather than um, engraved you know, and then, you know, we can think about later, you know, etched plates. And so that's one of the practical reasons. Another one is metal is so expensive, right? So if you think about you're trying to illustrate a book, let's, you know, give or take, even think about Vesalius, right? How many pages that is and think about using that number of copper plates, right? So if, you know, it depends, but if, you know, every so many pages, right, of a book, are illustrated, I mean, that would just be a sheer, uh, I mean, the cost of that production, right, would just be astronomical. And so that's why it takes a bit of time. But great question. And Dr. Gaines, I know that um, that uh, the, wood, the woodcuts stuck around for a while. I think you, you, I've heard you talk about the history of what happened to the, yeah, the woodcuts. Um, there was an article I read a number of years ago that said that the woodblocks from Vesalius's um, book went from Switzerland, which is where it was published. So, you know, consider that they had to take the drawings from Padua to Venice. They were made into to wood blocks there. And then they had to take the wood blocks over the Alps to Switzerland. And uh, as you've heard, they're, they're pretty delicate. In fact, if you dropped one of them, uh, that figure was probably toast. 
Um, so that was a pretty, you know, a pretty laborious trip, I imagine. The woodblocks remained in Switzerland for several hundred years and ended up in, uh, I believe it was in a library in Munich. Uh, I, I uh, frankly don't remember exactly how they got there, but they were sitting in a box and the box said on the, on the side of it, Vesalius, that's all it said. And the author of the paper who was a librarian in this, uh, in this library is the one that discovered that the, the woodblocks from 1543 had been sitting in this box for probably several hundred years. And this was in the thirties. And um, unfortunately during World War II, the library was bombed and uh, we've lost uh, the woodblocks from that. But all the way up into the, really the 1940s, these woodblocks survived. I do not know exactly what condition they were in. Uh, I can't imagine they, they were in very pristine condition, but it would have been fascinating to see what they were like, but unfortunately we lost them. Um, we have a question in the chat. Were the blocks reprinted before they were destroyed? No, not to my knowledge. They, they were just languishing for, for probably centuries from what I can, I can tell from this uh, article. Um, they, no one had done much with them and many people didn't realize what was in the box, let alone uh, what the state of the affairs were with these wood blocks. But they, they were around until, until they were lost in the war. Just checking to see if we have any questions. We've gotten some good commentary in um, the chat. People are kind of chiming in. Um, and Don also points out that the rolling mill produced flat sheets that were not developed until the end of the 1600s. So the metal sheets were hammered and scraped to make them flat instead of, instead of rolled. Um, do you know how they made them flat, Kelly, Dr. Fisher? Uh, the the plates, yeah, the early ones, just hammering. <laughs> Best of my knowledge, yeah. There might have been other techniques, <laughs> but I'm not. I, I'm not sure. What a what a terrible place to be an apprentice, right? Yeah. Banging and banging. <laughs> but there is a question here uh, from Fenna. So it says, "I'm sorry if I missed this, but do we know how many copies of?" The Humanis Corporis fabric cover produced. I'm interested in what happened to this publication, who bought it and valued it versus the poor reception. So uh, to my knowledge, we don't know exactly how many were produced. Um, no, I don't think anyone knows that. Um, the scholars have looked into this and, and I, I don't think they've, they, it's probably in the thousands, several thousand, but I, I don't think anyone really knows. Um, there are three editions. I wouldn't say additions. There were three printings that have occurred with Dihamani. One was the first printing. Then there were some edits uh, in the margins that Vesalius made. And there was a second printing, first edition, second printing. And that's the one I believe that Emory has. And then in 1555, there was a second edition. And there is strong evidence that he was working on a third edition when he, when he died. Um, but of the first and, and second editions, there's approximately 120 of those in existence. About 60 are first edition and the remaining are the second. Uh, so having a first edition, there's, there's really, you know, there's several dozen that are around, but we don't know how many were actually produced. And remember that these, uh, these were not printed in bound. Um, they were printed and you either bound them yourselves or you just dealt with it. So you had, a, you had to go somewhere else after the printer to get them bound. So it, it adds to the difficulty in answering that question. One more. Um, we have a question. In later editions, were the plates ever engraved or etched using the same images? So would you know where the, where the images came from from the 15... The 1550 edition. They, they were all from wood blocks, from what, from what I understand. They made probably were the same wood blocks that that were initially used, but I, I don't know the answer for sure on that. I mean, you can see the the remarkable detail that must have been uh, uh, needed in order to make them. I mean, the the drawings themselves must have been remarkable, but to make a wood block that detailed, um, and you know, it wasn't just simply for aesthetic purposes. These were 
uh, images that had to be accurate in order to teach properly. And therefore you had to make sure that the woodblock uh, was in fact what you were trying to represent from the drawing. Did Van Kolkar know anatomy or did he just draw pictures based on- from, uh, As well as any of the artists of the Renaissance knew anatomy. And they, I mean, he was there for a lot of the dissections. So I'm sure as many of the artists of that era did, they were around and maybe he even did some. One of the things we don't know for sure in, in Die Humanica Porus Fabrica is what von Kelchar did and what other people may have done in terms of the art. Uh, and it has been suggested that some of the smaller figures may have been Vesalius himself uh, doing it, but because uh, I don't believe any of it was signed, we don't know for sure. We do have a question. Um, someone's asking, were there prints of the organs? Uh, um, prints of the organs, I'm not quite sure what so that- So the means. images, I guess. Um, yeah, um, I, I didn't show, um, uh, the, the Vesalius's book was really seven books. Um, there was a book on, uh, on uh, musculature, on bones, on, um, uh, I'm trying to remember them all on vasculature, there was a book on the brain, there was a book on the chest, and there was a book on the abdomen. And each of the, the books had their own figures, of course. And I chose to show the ones that demonstrated the most detail. I only showed one that showed anything from the abdomens. But yes, the, the organs, in fact, were portrayed in a lot of the books. And one of the most um, really important um, distinctions that this book showed, um, and, and I didn't really have time to go into it, is that Galen um, is, was really one of the first uh, physicians to recognize the importance of the brain and what it did to the body. Uh, the Hippocratics believed, because of the folds of your brain, that all it was was essentially a radiator to radiate any heat that your, your body may have made. And Vesalius recognized, along with others, but he recognized that the brain was really where thought occurs and the thought that you had is what made your muscles move through the nerves. So he, he made a, a great deal out of this. And the, the way this thought process started, according to Galen, was a conversion of some ethereal stuff that he theorized in the, in the blood called pneuma, vital pneuma is what gave you life who breathed pneuma, never really well explained, in with your first breath, it got combined with blood on the left side, your left ventricle, and transferred to the body. And then at the base of the brain, in what he called the Riti Mirabili, a miracle network, a big network of, of blood vessels, it was converted into psychic pneuma, which allowed you to do thinking and move your body, et cetera. The problem, is that the reading Mirabili does exist in animals such as sheep, but humans don't have one. So the linchpin of the way he thought the mind and body worked is something that Vesalius refuted with his figures in De Humani Caporis Fabrica in the brain. And this was really a major change in thinking. And it was one of the major things that told people that Galen could be wrong. So we have a question. Um, are either of you aware of specific artists who used um, images from Vesalius or have or owned her early work on musculature? I think maybe um, the, she's asking whether um, they knew whether um, earlier work on musculature was was around and that maybe Van Kelkar or Vesalius had seen. I'm sure that they had. I mean, many artists had been looking into this for, I mean, well before 1540, 1543, um, artists had, had been uh, looking into this. Um, so I have, I have little doubt that, um, that Van Kelkar, pardon me, Van Kelkar and Vesalius uh, had been influenced by others but remember that the purpose of this was not art. The purpose of this, uh, these, these figures was to demonstrate accurate human anatomy. And that if you look carefully at some of the muscular figures, there are little labels on them, A, B, C, D. And in the text, they would tell you what muscle that was. 
and where it began its origin and where it, it sort of ended, it's called its, its insertion. So the origin insertion was something that students always had to learn about muscles. And uh, so again, the purpose of this is different than a lot of what, what a lot of Renaissance artists wanted out of, out of a dissection of a human. In this case, the purpose was to demonstrate what muscles were there, where they started, where they ended, and to be accurate in that regard. And that was different than what many Renaissance artists got out of dissections. I, I can, Doug, oh yeah, I was, please, I was, I can, I'm in, I was gonna ask you. <laughs> So um, a couple of things. So in terms of artists that knew images from Vesalius, um, it's likely that there's a group, the um, essentially Academy of Design that developed in Florence during the second half of the 16th century. There were um, many workshops in anatomy and certainly artists were aware of Vesalius's work. Um, you know, there were certainly copies of his books and we're looking at those in addition to perhaps studying perhaps live dissections, right, or parts of the human body. Um, a famous example of an artist that actually represents Vesalius's treatise in their work is Rembrandt. Uh, Rembrandt paints yep. um, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, and in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you can see there is a book, and it's difficult to read, but you see that it actually has Vesalius's name on it in the yep. title of the treatise. Um, whether did Rembrandt own a copy and know what was going on in it? Maybe not, but um, it clearly was a sign, right, for in this painting to represent an, uh, a famous anatomist, right, to at least have knowledge or access to that book, right? That was very impo important. Good point. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, we do have another question. So we have question. one more question, and then we can maybe start to wind down a bit. Um, uh, the question says, thank you both. Question for Dr. Fisher. I'm interested in the idea of an open market for printed materials. Do you think this applies more to the way prints are sold in shops where anyone who could afford them could purchase them or the way they're produced, not always commissioned by a specific patron? I'm interested in the role of printer publisher in designing commissioning prints as um, prints or printed books from printmakers. That's an excellent question. I will say it's it's both. So in, in certain cases, right, we, somebody won't commission a work. So that means that either the designer, the printmaker and or publisher, right? It depends on how many different agents are involved. Um, sometimes we have a shop, right? Which will have several different people working on one project. Um, and most of the time, yeah, those aren't commissions. So you, the artist and the, you know, uh, print publisher, the printmaker, whoever's involved really needs to anticipate that demand. Um, and I just wanna make sure I got the second part of that question. Yeah, so the role of the printer publishers. Um, and so that also leaves a lot up that we don't really know. So in some cases, was it the publisher who owned the printing shop, for instance, who says, I think we should be selling these types of images, right? In some cases that could have happened. In some cases an artist might have approached them and say, I want to produce these works. Okay, let me partner with you. So in terms of uh, where the idea kind of originates, we don't really know, but it's this was a vast network of people. So there's likely a lot of collaboration, a lot of talking involved. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Baines and Dr. Fisher. This was really enlightening and fascinating. Um, and uh, uh, just for the attendees, this this will be available and it will be on the Emory YouTube channel um, soon. So um, share with your friends and we'll hopefully get lots more views on YouTube. Um, but this is a wonderful evening. Thank you so very much. And thank for everyone for attending as well. But I would also like to say special thanks to our colleague Lolita for ensuring that the event went so smoothly throughout. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, have a good evening, everyone, and thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks so much for the presentations. Bye. Thank you.